Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody stick your hand out like this toward me. Put your hand out like this toward me. Now move it up and down. Welcome. It is so good to see each and every one of you today in the house of the Lord. I am blessed that you're here. I'm grateful and glad to see you today in the house of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. Anybody glad in the house of God today? Some of you need to tell your face. We're glad. <laughs> Give me a big smile this morning. We're, we're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. That was just a little joke. If you got your Bibles and you want to turn with me in the book of Psalms, I'm going to read one verse of Scripture this morning. Uh, you can follow on the screen as, as well or turn in your Bible. Psalm 86, verse number 5. Psalm 86, verse 5. And this is what... The psalmist recorded, For you, O Lord, are so good. You are so ready to forgive. And you are so full. What we just sang about unfailing love for all who ask for your help. Can somebody put a big amen right there? I'm going to read that one more time. For you, O Lord, are so good. Somebody shout so good. So ready to forgive. And so full. God is full of unfailing love today. Amen. For all that ask Him for His help. I want to begin this morning a brand new sermon series with you. It'll last for the next three weeks or so through the end of the month. But it's a, a brand new sermon series entitled, The Good and Beautiful God. And for years, I've heard a, a call and response in this church. And other churches, as I've traveled around the country and I've preached and sang, and some I've just been there in attendance, but I've heard folks use this exact same call and response. God is good, and all the time. Now, chances are, if you've been in church any length of time, you've at least heard, probably use that same call and response yourself. But I've got a real question that I want to ask to you this morning. And it's this, do we really believe that God is good? See, I, I know it's cliche. I know it's the, the right thing to say, but I'm talking about at the core of who we are. Do we really believe that God is good? I'm talking about in spite of things like the Holocaust, in spite of the Titanic tragedy, in spite of 9-11, the Oklahoma City bombing, the Boston Marathon bombing, the Columbine massacre, the Virginia Tech massacre, countless school shootings and church shootings and hurricanes like Michael that just swept up through the panhandle of, of Florida, tornadoes, volcanoes, earthquakes, cancer, Alzheimer's, fibromyalgia, heart disease, diabetes, and stillborn babies. Do we still have enough faith? To believe in the concept of a good God. Or have our experiences caused us maybe to unknowingly and maybe even unintentionally doubt the goodness of God. A few months ago, back in July, we had our Pastor Appreciation Day. And Pastor Timmy, our youth pastor, came up and, and he... he talked a little bit that morning, and he made a statement that I've never forgotten, a statement that has really, really stuck with me, and I've thought about this. He said, many people have trouble surrendering their lives. They have trouble giving God their all because they just don't know if they can really trust God because they doubt that God is good. When we doubt God's goodness, it creates distrust in our lives. It creates disbelief in our lives. One writer said, the most important belief that we possess is the accurate knowledge of who God is. And that's what this sermon series is about. I begin to think about the image of God that we have in our minds. The concepts that we have. These concepts, these, these ideas about God, they've been shaped by the narratives that we've learned to accept. What are these narratives? They're stories. They're stories. We've heard about God. Stories that have been taught to us from our parents. Stories we've heard from pulpit lecturers. 
narratives that we've learned to accept because of the experiences that we've endured in life. But I wonder if we were to take the stories, the concepts, if you will, that we have about God, and we were to compare them with the truths that Jesus revealed to us in the Gospels about His Heavenly Father, how would those things compare? That's what the next three weeks we're going to be talking about. The good and beautiful God. We're going to find out that God is trustworthy. That God is generous, that God is love, that God is holy, that God is is self-sacrificing, that God is transformational. And it all starts with the message today on this simple thought, that the God we serve is so good. God is good today. The Bible tells us that God's goodness is defined by His character And by his actions. Psalms 119 verse 68 says you are good and what you do is good. See God is good by nature. He is morally excellent. He is extraordinarily beautiful. And he's extravagantly bountiful. He is a good and beautiful God. But you know what the devil wants to do? The devil wants to use the troubles of life to distort the image that we have of God. Ultimately, the devil wants you and he wants I to because of the circumstances and the difficulties and the trials that we have to endure in life. He wants those things to cause us to doubt God's goodness. Because he knows if we doubt God's goodness, you know what will happen? It will affect every other area of our lives spiritually. If we're talking about pastor, I'm saying if we doubt God's goodness, our faith in him will never be secure. Our hope in Him will never be strong. Our love for Him will never be sincere. At the end of the day, there's one thing that you and I have got to decide upon. God's goodness is not conditional. Hello, somebody. It's not conditional. That means it's not dependent upon the environment that we're in. But God's goodness is absolute. It was established in the beginning. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Absolute. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who... Does not change like shifting shadows. His goodness is absolute. It is fixed eternally. Hebrews said it like this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was good. He is good. And God will forever be a good God. Despise what goes on in this life. In spite of what we may have to go through. You might have had a bad day. But you got to remind yourself that God is still good. You might have gotten a bad report from the doctor, but you got to make up your mind to believe that God is still good. You might be working hard just trying to make ends meet and get the bills paid every, every month, but you got to tell yourself that the God you serve is still a good God. You've got to believe it in your heart of hearts. Psalms 34, 1 through 3. Says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Not just when everything's going good. Not just when I'm singing on the mountain, but that means when I'm in the valley, when I'm walking through the fire, when I'm walking through the rivers, when life is not good, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually, every day of my life, His praise shall be in my mouth because He's a good God today. The psalmist went on, David went on. Psalms 34, verse number 8, to say this. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The invitation there is for us to taste. How many of you know you don't taste unless you eat? And you don't eat until you're hungry. But the Bible said that those that will get a real hunger in their soul for righteousness, those that will get a thirsting in their soul for God, they shall be satisfied. Oh, taste and see that God is good today. Taste and see 
It's an invitation for you to experience it for yourself. How many know you can't take nobody's word for it? You can't live it out based on somebody else's experience. You've got to experience the goodness of God firsthand. But when you do, when you come face to face with the goodness of our God, you will realize His mercy and His grace and His benevolence and His compassion and His provision and His protection and His love and affection. They are renewed every day and to allow you to say of the Lord, You are good. Your love endures forever and your faithfulness continues throughout all generations because God God is good all the time and all the time God is good. I read a story about JJ and Tiffany Johnson. Young couple men love the Lord. Got a couple of kids. They live in Concord, North Carolina. Next door neighbors to us. They decided back in June of 2017, so a little over a year ago, they were going to take a mommy and daddy vacation. They decided to take a seven-day cruise to the Bahamas. They went to, to a place called the Atlantis. Anybody know what the Atlantis is? A beautiful, beautiful resort in Nassau, Bahamas, and they Stayed there for a few days and did some excursions and what have you. And on the last day of the cruise, they decided to go snorkeling. Not too far from the Atlantis Resort. J.J., the husband, is off swimming a little distance away from his wife, Tiffany. And she said she felt something in the water breeze by her. And when she turned around and came to her senses, she was eyeball to eyeball with a tiger shark. And before she knew what had happened, this shark had her right arm in its mouth. And she began to to cry out and, and plead for her husband to come and help her. And he swam as quick as he could over to her. And together they managed to get the, sh- the shark off of her arm. And the thing took off. And, but the, there, there was blood everywhere. And they didn't know how bad the bite was. And he swam with her back to the shore. And he drug her up on the beach. And it was there that he realized just how dangerous this attack had been. Because her right arm from the elbow down was gone. They took her to the Nassau hospital and they tried to do what they could for her there, but they just were not adequately adequately equipped to to take care of this kind of of, uh, accident. And and they told her, they said, we're going to have to meadow vacuum back to the United States to get the care that, that you need. And immediately, not only she lost her arm, but the problems one by one started to stack up against her. First off... They did not have a passport. If you've ever taken a cruise, you know that you can leave from an American port. And as long as you come back to that same American port, you don't have to have a passport. All you need is a birth certificate. But to fly internationally, you got to have a passport. They didn't have one. They told her, we cannot guarantee you. We can helicopter ride you to the U.S. We can't guarantee you they'll let you back in. Because you don't have a passport. On top of that, they called the insurance company. Guess what? You're not covered in the Bahamas first off. And if you were covered, we're not going to pay for a medevac flight. So $16,000 out of your pocket to get rolled over to the U.S. And don't even know for sure if they're going to let you in to get the care that you need. On top of that, your arm's gone, and and you're facing all of these these physical limitations and and a life-threatening infection at this point. She said she lay there in that hospital bed in in Nassau, and she thought, why? God, I've I've given you my life. I've served you. I've taken my kids to church. I've taught them all the things right and wrong from this book. I've tried to live a holy life. Why is all this going on? How many have been there? Why is is all this? And she said she could feel the devil creeping up inside of her, trying to cause her to doubt the goodness of God. 
She said, I made up my mind right there in that hospital bed. She said, I won't question. I won't blame God. I won't doubt his goodness, but I'll use this as an opportunity that everywhere I go, I will declare that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. She said the doctors came in and were trying to ask her questions. She said, I'd open up my mouth and try to answer them. And all that was coming out was that heavenly language. She said, the Holy Ghost was making intercession through me with words that man cannot understand. They put her on that helicopter, medevaced her to the U.S. Supernaturally. If you ever come through U.S. customs, you know that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Bless God, I went to Africa one time and bought me this big old... Here I am getting off cubes. I'm not reading my notes. I got this big old rock hippopotamus, Kathy. You remember that? Made out of solid rock. Wrapped that thing up, tried to protect it all the way home. I got to U.S. Customs. I had it wrapped up in all my clothing, some parts I can't talk about, trying to keep it from, from breaking. Got to the U.S. Customs. What's in your bag? It's a hippopotamus. A hippopotamus. It's a rock hippopotamus we got to see it I had to drag it out my drawers was all over the place pulling my clothes out trying to unwrap his hippopotamus it's not easy coming through U.S. Customs Kenya didn't care what I had America had a problem with it supernaturally U.S. Customs let them come right in no questions asked they didn't even ask if they had a passport the favor of God the goodness of God they took her in, got her into the hospital, started doing some work. Of course, the arm is gone, but supernaturally, that, that infection, the infection was gone. God healed her body. She was, not only that, they were able to save, listen to this, the nerve endings in the end of her elbow. What does that mean? It means she became a candidate for a robotic arm, a brand new procedure. Put that next picture up. This robotic arm that she can supernaturally control with her own mind and her own thoughts, her own willpower, causes that robotic arm to raise up in the hand to open and close. Some time passed, and she got to thinking, wait a minute, J.J., we've never gotten a bill from the insurance company. Or that medevac flight. They started making some phone calls. Finally got the right person on the phone. He said, oh man, we forgot to call you. But shortly after your flight, we got a phone call. And it was an anonymous donor. But he wrote a check for $16,000. And he paid that bill in full. Today, Tiffany travels all over the world. She stands on church stages and she stands on secular stages. But her message is the same. He is a good God and he's greatly to be praised. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good today. Somebody shout, he's a good God. He's a good God. He's a good God today. When you've tasted and seen that God is good, can I tell you there's few things that will be able to persuade you otherwise. Amen. Watch this. God is good. And all the time, for just a few minutes, I want to talk about some of the narratives, the stories I believe that we have accepted in our lives that may not, that, that really don't, line up correctly with what Jesus taught us about God. The first narrative that I believe some of us have, have accepted in our lives is this. God is angry at me. How could, you, how could you say that, Pastor? Well, when we go through difficulties, when we go through struggles, some of the first questions that we ask is, what have I done to make God mad? Or maybe you've said it more like this, what have I done to deserve this? 
Right? So maybe something I've done, God is angry, he's upset at me, so, so he, he's, he's causing me to go through this, this difficulty or this challenge, this trouble in my life right now. We have this image of God that he's some kind of an, an angry judge, and it's because of our experiences with people, people that are in authority positions in our life, man, that lash out at us every time we mess up and we get this idea of a God that's just ready to write us off every time we fail him. We think what we're going through, it must be the result of his anger and his displeasure with my life. That's what the disciples thought. Remember the time they came across the man that the Bible said had been blind since birth? And what question did they ask immediately? Who sinned? Was it, was it this man that sinned or, or was it his parents? What are they asking? They're asking who did something to deserve this. Who, who, who in this family has done something, God, that now you're angry at them and that's, that's, why, that's why he's blind from birth. And Jesus said, wait a minute. Who, who sinned? Nobody sinned. This is not the result of this man's sin or, or this, his parents' sin, but he was born blind. This is Jesus' word. So that God's works might be revealed in him. Jesus drew a clear line in the sand. This is not the result of an angry God that's passing out judgments on man because of sin. But this is an opportunity saved for a day like today to make a bold declaration that God is good. And the Bible said the man born blind went home seeing. Listen to me this morning. God is not angry at you. How do you know? Psalms 145 verse 8, the Lord is gracious, the Lord is full of compassion, the Lord is slow to anger, the Lord is abounding in mercy and loving kindness. How many know God is for you, not against you? How many know God loves you with an everlasting love? Do you know today that he has plans to give you a hope and a future? God is not angry at you, he is a good God today. Another narrative I think sometimes that we, we struggle with is in our finite minds and in our humanistic mind is that God wants or, or God is happy to punish us. I came across a little comic strip. Some might have seen Calvin and Hobbes. Anybody seen that little comic? Little boy and his whatever that little thing is. I think it's a dog. And Hobbes asked Calvin, he says, Calvin, do you believe that there's a God? And in the little comic strip, Calvin's response is, well, somebody's out to get me. Is, is that our view of God? That he sits on this, this throne, I think it was that movie Bruce Almighty, that he called him the Almighty Smiter. That, that he just sits up in heaven ready to smite us and, and excited to punish us. Is the punishment for sin death? Yes. But the scripture doesn't end there. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God doesn't want to punish you. What he wants to do is save you. John 3, 17, God sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, not to punish the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is patient with you, not wanting anybody to perish, but that everybody would come to repentance. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, I, the Lord, take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't want the wicked to perish apart from the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a judgment day coming, folks. But thank God for today. Because today, we still live in the age of grace. Today we still live in the age of mercy. God is gracious and merciful toward us. The Bible says, wanting all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Back in 2001, after 9-11 happened, I'm sure a well-meaning TV preacher got behind the camera and made this statement. 
and I quote, God was so fed up with sinners that he used 9-11 to punish the United States and New York City particularly. God was so fed up with sinners. Can I tell you something, folks? Jesus is married to the backslider. In the Bible I read, it said he will leave the 90 and the 9 to go looking for the 1. God is not fed up. He will go where you and I refuse to go to compel them to come in because God wants all men to be saved. His blood, the Bible said, became the propitiation, the payment for our sin. But not for my sin only, but for the sin of the entire world. God's fed up with sinners. Does that sound like a gracious and compassionate God who the Bible said His mercies are renewed every morning? Maybe you, because of the narratives that you've learned to accept in your life, maybe even you questioned when 9-11 happened. Maybe, maybe you question when these natural disasters like Hurricane Michael that just swept up through Florida, the panic. Maybe you wonder, is that the punishment of God? Well, let me answer it with an answer that Jesus used. Because in Luke chapter 13, there were some Galileans that had been slaughtered at the hands of Pilate. The Bible actually says that he mixed their blood with the blood of sacrifices. And these well-meaning folks came to Jesus and basically were asking, what did they do? Is, Is this God's punishment on these men and women that were slaughtered at the hands of Pilate? And you know what Jesus' response was? Do you think... That because these Galileans suffered in this way, that there are any more worse sinners or more guilty than you are? He said, but I tell you the truth, you will all perish unless you repent. Can I, can I remind you of something today? We were all sinners. Every one of us in this room deserved death. We deserve the punishment of death under the law. But thank God for his unmerited favor. Somebody ought to say, thank you Jesus for grace and mercy today. That saved an old wretch like me. Thank God for his grace. Titus chapter 2 verse number 11 says, The grace of God has appeared and it has brought salvation to all men. Aren't you glad God doesn't look at the color of your skin? And he doesn't look at how much money you got in the bank. He's no respect specter of persons but his grace has come that all men young and old rich and poor slave and free they might all receive salvation in the kingdom of God today why is that because God is good all the time and all the time God is good I'm closing with this this morning if the musicians want to come The last narrative that I believe probably everybody in this room, including myself, we've maybe learned to accept in our life. And it's this. God is good to me when life is good to me. As long as life's good, then I have no trouble believing God is good. Man, let let life dish out some problems and some trials and tribulations. Perhaps we start wondering, God, where are you? God, where where are you? Why am I I going through what I'm going through? Are are you still listening? Are you still still aware of, of my condition, of my circumstances? You know what the Bible tells us in Matthew 5, 45? God makes the sun shine on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You know what I would rather that scripture say? 
God makes the sun shine on the righteous and the rain pour on the wicked. Isn't that what we'd rather want? We want every day to be a cloud-free day and the sun shining. But that's not what the Bible says. It says the sun will shine on the good and the bad and the rain will fall on the bad and the good. We don't understand all of life's difficulties. We don't understand all the tribulations that we go through. The trials of life sometimes, man, are overwhelming to us. And we may not ever understand those things truthfully till, till we get to heaven, but I want you to know something today. God, His goodness does not change with the tribulations of this life. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying God is good even when life isn't good. You don't believe me? Ask Job. You don't believe me? Ask Paul and Silas. You don't believe me? Ask John the Baptist. Ask Tiffany Johnson. Life wasn't so good to her. But she knew God was still good. Ask Mary Harrison. Or Alice East. Or Lisa Parker. Or Pat Palmer. Or Donna East. Or Sherry O'Dell. Or countless others I could talk about in this congregation. The life has not been that good. But God has been eternally good. God's goodness is, it can't be decided by the troubles of this life because it was decided a long time ago. Jesus said in the book of Mark, why do you call me good? He said, no one is good except God alone. You know what he's saying? He was saying God is the measuring stick, Kathy. God is the standard by which you judge all goodness. See, everything in this life that we, we try to call good, you know, we'll say that meal was good or that movie was good or this was good. Every single one of those things in this life we try to label good is still at best tainted and imperfect. But God is the only original flawless, perfect, absolute picture of all that is good. God is not just good, but He is great. And He is greatly to be praised. Can somebody say amen? On the mountain or in the valley, when the sun shines or the rain falls, when life's up or when life is down, my prayer for you, that you will be able to declare from the depth of your heart God is good all the time and all the time God is good would you stand to your feet this morning I'm going to ask you maybe just to close your eyes for just a moment. And I, I want to perhaps ask a question today. Nobody looking around. But how many are here this morning and would say, Pastor, those, those narratives you're talking about, man, God being angry with me and God wanting to punish me, man, I've been there. There have been some areas of my life where I know I've failed God. I know I've, I've slipped away from a, a right relationship with Him. Maybe at one point, at one time in my life, I, I was saved and I was serving the Lord. And, and I was trying to live right, man. But some things came in and worked their way into my life. And they've driven a wedge between me and Christ. And I've wondered, is God angry at me? Has He written me off and said, for the last time, this is it? Is he, is he so fed up with sinners, the way that, that TV preacher put it? Is, is that where God and my relationship is and it's destined to stay forever? I came by to tell you this morning, the Bible says if we confess, He's just, He's merciful, He's gracious to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
He loves you with an everlasting love. The song we sing about unconditional love, love that we really can't even comprehend with our minds because we have no problem sometimes writing people off and, and, and failing to love them the way that we should. But God never looks at us like that. It's always through the love of God. So much love that he took my sin and your sin and he nailed it perpetually to the cross of Calvary. The payment for sin is death, my friend, but the gift of God is eternal life. And I want to offer that to you this morning. Jesus has come that you might live. If you're here today, maybe there's some stuff in your heart, man, you just need to to repent to the Lord. Nobody looking around just between you and the Lord. Would you just lift your hands in this sanctuary today? God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand, young. Anybody else? There's two. Anybody else say, Pastor, that's me, man. I, I'm thankful for the realization today that God's not angry at me. He doesn't want to punish me. He wants to save me. He would that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. There's two. Anybody else say, Pastor, that's me, man. I, I need to repent of my sins and ask Jesus to come into my life. A fresh and a new. I need to make a fresh commitment. God bless you. I see your hand. There's three. Anybody else? One last time. Anybody else? I'm going to ask everybody that would, would you just pray this prayer with me out loud? Would you just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know it's my sin that separates me from you. But I'm asking you today to come into my heart, to wash me clean, to forgive me of all of my sins. Help me to walk in the paths that you've laid out for me. Help me to live a life that's pleasing to you. I surrender my all to you. Because I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are good all the time. I accept you as my Savior and I confess you as my Lord. In Jesus' name.